description is also being enabled. All right, well, welcome everyone uh, to our featured speaker series uh, from Affordable Learning Georgia. This is a series that focuses on uh, some of the big successes in the creation and adaptation and implementation of open educational resources and other affordable materials. This week we're going to hear from Shane Peterson, Sabine Smith, Dylan Goldblatt, and Susan Estrella uh, at Kennesaw State University on their Der und Mehr textbook for German courses. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to the team. Take it away. Hi, thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'm Shane Peterson. I was the project lead and uh, I came to uh, the USG system about three and a half years ago. And when I was coming from a previous institution, one of the first things people said to me when they heard where I was going was, Georgia, they are leaders in OER creation. I had sort of dabbled in it there and gotten a little bit of first experience. I was kind of surprised to learn that and, and quickly uh, got my bearings and figured out what was going on. So this is a phenomenal uh, project that we've been able to be involved in. And I'm uh, grateful for my colleagues uh, Sabina Dillon and Susanna for their teamwork here and really the way that we came together as a, a, a large team with different interests and different expertise um, and we're able to create a, a really coherent and useful product for our students. Um, our overview today of the presentation is uh, four parts. Uh, we'll do a summary which is going to be the longest part. Uh, we'll look at motivations, premises, and then uh, give you some samples out of two of the four courses. So you get a, a feel for what we did um, with this German uh, open uh, textbook and look briefly at some initial impacts we've been able to ascertain. Um, we'll talk also about team dynamics, how we work together, what roles we had, how we achieved a consistent product. We'll look at some, pan uh, some challenges, including the pandemic, but others as well, and then uh, leave some time for conclusions and discussions at the end. <clears throat> so uh, we came to this project um, sort of uh, more rapidly than I would have uh, wanted because our former textbook, which we had used for the first four courses in the German curriculum, uh, was going out of print and we needed to pivot fairly quickly. And in the process of finding a new textbook, we found um, that in German studies and in German language learning especially, uh, there's sort of a big change going on in the textbook field. Uh, traditional textbooks are falling out of favor and a lot of New initiatives have been forming, and one that's uh, formed in 2015 and 2016 was a textbook out of Princeton University developed by Dr. Jamie Rankin called Der D. Das. Der D. and Das are the three words, the three ways that you say the in German, because German is a gendered language. Um, and what is revolutionary about his approach, uh, I'll get to in a minute, is its focus on vocabulary. Um, but this is what we ended up adopting. It is a no cost uh, textbook, but it is not an open textbook. It's password protected um, and it is not something that one can adapt um, because it's not licensed as such. Um, and so we decided um, that we wanted to use the textbook, but we also fairly early on noticed that for our particular students, we needed to um, add some, some supplementary material and so we created an open educational resource that can be used both ideally as an augmentation to Darity DAS, um, but also can be a standalone product for um, programs looking for that as well. Or it can also be used uh, select selectively um, unit wise uh, for individual courses and some colleagues uh, elsewhere already doing that. Um, but we're really grateful to Princeton for sharing this with us for free. We were the first large and first public university to adopt Darity DAS. We were, I think, number four or five. And now there's over 20 uh, universities across the country who have adopted it. Um, and what's unique about its approach, which we then carried forward in our, our product that supplements it and complements it, is the focus on vocabulary and on the most frequent uh, words in a given language. Um, hence the name of the Princeton product, Der die Das. The is one of the most common words in the German language. And our spinoff, Der und Mehr, uh, which is roughly translated the and more. Uh, the and more are three also um, top most frequent words in the German language. 
And what's revolutionary about both of, uh, products is, is that they, we follow the lead of, of Derrida Das um, by focusing on the most frequent words in the language. Um, rather than focusing on grammar as the primary um, focus or something else, because research has shown that in German, um, learning the thousand most frequent word families can lead to 90% spoken comprehension and 70% written comprehension. And typical textbooks that have been around for a long time fall uh, far short of that goal. Um, there was a study in 2010 showing that the top four textbooks on average um, only taught about half of the thousand most important words, but they included a lot of other words that are not very helpful, not very relevant. Um, but it's not just about the most relevant words, it's also about the types uh, of ways they're presented. Um, so a typical textbook would use thematic sets, which means we're going to learn all of the uh, fruits. We're going to learn pineapple, apple, uh, pear, peach, etc. Um, versus a semantic set, which thinks in terms of, okay, if I need to go to the grocery store and buy a pineapple, I'm going to need to know the word pineapple, or maybe I just need to know the category fruit, because once I see a pineapple, I'll be able to pick it out. But I also need to know words about uh, how to pay, about uh, maybe directions in the store, about a uh, shopping cart, uh, cash versus credit. Um, all of those different words is sort of a, a semantic set that's going to help me be more successful in that activity. Um, but the focus is really that the more words you know, then the easier it is to look up or guess out of context the other words. And so we we have followed that model uh, in our our product um, Dare und Mehr as ideally a supplement to that text. And when we went about supplementing, and I'll turn it over to my uh, colleague Sabina here in a moment. We were particularly pleased with Derrida Das in the way that it taught really strong vocabulary, really strong uh, reading comprehension, listening comprehension, um, writing skills. But we thought that our students in particular needed more oral communication um, uh, practice, and they also needed more career readiness skills. And that was uh, a key of our focus in developing Dare on Mare. Thank you, Shane. Very nice transition for me to report on the concept in terms of local needs that I think are fairly ubiquitous for learners, especially at the college level, but not necessarily only at the college level. We follow the research lead and the studies that document that an essential obligation and mission for foreign language departments or world language departments is to prepare the generation for career readiness via such critical skills such as an attitude of openness and curiosity, but also a tolerance for ambivalence and ambiguity, a um, appreciation of um, knowledge gaps that can be bridged by looking for cues and making sense in various creative ways. This attitude is something that we found is um, definitely a challenge for many of our learners and the text and our project also try to address it. The second category is also that we wanted to prepare our learners for work, study and um, international or domestic experiences in developing, of course, their language and culture knowledge, and that oftentimes textbooks lag behind, do not have authentic materials, particularly in the German um, materials selections, because they are rather generic, sometimes comedic or cartoonish, and oftentimes outdated when you still see um, tapes or DVDs that some of our younger learners no longer have even access to. And second big component was, of course, guidance by American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, namely the oral and also written communication skills for students in the um, three communication modes. And we try to systematically integrate that, but in connection always with really interesting topics that would motivate students to uh, reflect on things that pertain to their um, generational experience, such as the driving age, the drinking age, that they know it is something that is relevant to them rather than maybe some other a little bit more dusty topics. And with that, I'm going to um, I forgot to take control, I'm sorry, but I'm going to go to the next slide and I'll give you a brief overview about 
the project that had the four courses, as we said, at its core, namely the sequence from first semester to fourth semester. We approached it in a structural um, tactic that we wanted to have the four semesters have an even amount of reliable materials and resources that um, ended up being 192 learning activities with authentic materials, multimedia focus, so not only podcasts, but also images, um, infographics, little authentic texts that were not redacted for the learner and um, fine-tuned to their vocabulary skill, but intentionally left open so that the learner would be exposed to real real world materials. And then the scaffolding that would support in a strategic way their integrated approach to these um, activities and materials. And my colleague Suzanne is going to go into more detail about that. You're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Zavina. Um, all the activities in our compilation, they are may follow a certain pattern. Um, this makes it easier for an instructor using this valuable resource and also for an autonomous student who is learning German independently. Each set of our activities is introduced by learning objectives in the form of can-do statements derived from the active um, proficiency guidelines. And the wording in this section incorporates a list of verifiable verbs to ensure that the student eventually performs a measurable task. At the end of this section, we also provide a point of reference to the student or the instructor um, so they know on which proficiency level they are expected to perform in this particular situation. Um, then we provide, as Sabine pointed out, a real life scenario so the student can connect with a real life situation that he is very likely to encounter if he uses the language in the context provided um, by the topic. Um, further, uh, we invite students to explore a set of tools to get acquainted with the pertinent vocabulary, the grammar structures and cultural aspects that will be helpful for the upcoming tasks and uh, he can study these tools and refer to them throughout the assignment or use them as a reference at any point. Now we come to the heart of this compilation, the three scaffolded tasks. We selected three tasks for each topic, one in the interpretive mode, one in the presentational mode, and one in the interpersonal mode, again in line with the active for proficiency benchmarks. Um, after performing these three tasks, the student is invited to reflect on his or her performance um, and to gather individual takeaways, what went well, what did not go so well, and in anticipation of the letter, um, we give even a few suggestions as to what a student can do differently to improve the learning outcome the next time. This concludes the learning cycle, another vital component of this compilation, Dale and Mayer, um, thus helping the student to become a self-directed learner. Finally, if the student wishes to explore the subject even deeper, he or she can use the starting points provided in the last segment, the digging deeper segment. So now let me share with you two samples. Um, from One is from a German 1001 course beginner level and one from a German 2001 course to demonstrate how this pattern is reflected in activities at these different um, levels. The activities are introduced by the learning objectives, um, the set of goals in form of can-do statements, um, in these can-do statements, we are using verifiable, verifiable verbs such as identify, interpret, and so on to make sure that the upcoming tasks will be measurable. And at the end, we also include a proficiency benchmark. Here are the verifiable verbs. And here's the proficiency benchmark. Um, he obviously at the novice level, um, since this is actually the very first activity in our compilation. Next, we provide the real life scenario, in this case, greeting someone from a German speaking country and exchanging names, clarifying names, spelling the name and sharing of interests, which um, can all be accomplished by using high frequency words, since this indeed is an everyday scenario um, that the student will most likely encounter. So this provides the student with a plan and also like a roadmap through the upcoming activities. Now we introduce the student to the toolbox consisting of pertinent vocabulary, grammar structures, and cultural clues needed to perform the upcoming scaffolded tasks. The student can study this toolbox to get prepared for the scaffolded activities and therefore is now in learning mode. 
Now we get to the heart of our compilation, the scaffolded um, activities. The set of three activities is launched by an introduction into the topic by providing multimedia resources such as videos, short texts, statistics, music, and so on, from which a learner can glean information related to the topic and in an authentic um, cultural context. The learner can here take notes and is here with starting to show his learning process. His or her learning is becoming measurable at this point and we can observe it. Finally, we dive into the first part of each activity set. Uh, the student is provided with a set of prompts that he or she can answer in writing based on the resources given earlier, in this case, um, the, the identification of a certain video uh, with a certain content, specific content covered in the video, and the task to make a personal selection of information that he or she would like to share in the next one. The second activity, um, after having done some prep work, um, the student now can go into the second activity where he's presenting information. He's, he has gathered information. He can prepare a small presentation and, and use this for a short video or in class or in any type of environment that he would like to choose. Finally, we provide an activity where the student can share what he or she has gleaned in the previous activities by having a conversation with another student or a native speaker or the instructor or whatever may be the case. Um, these three activities are measurable, observable, and we can grade them as instructors and the student can also observe his or her progress. At the end, and in order to complete the learning cycle and help students to become self-directed learners, we offer a moment of reflection. As mentioned earlier, we're inviting them to look back at what went well and not so well, and also offer tips to help him or her to improve next time. Um, finally, in case the student is really interested in this topic um, and he would like to or she would like to dig a little bit deeper, or if the instructor needs some additional material to post on the applicable LMS for differentiation purposes in the classroom or to enrich an online course, the Digging Deeper section offers a few additional starting points in the form of links to videos, learning material, um, and investigative, but also reflective questions. In my second sample, you will see the same structure again, so we will really just flip through this and I will annotate very briefly the samples from the German course at the 2001 level, a lot further advanced than what we looked at before. However, the pattern is the same. So even if I have never taught that course, which indeed I have not, <laughs> I can find exactly what I need and I can do so very quickly. We begin with the goal, um, the learning objective, um, outlined by the can-do statements, and again, we use verifiable verbs um, where, where um, in order to make sure that the set of activities will be measurable, and a proficiency bench line is also, uh, again, provided for the instructor's use or so that the student knows where he is in his learning program. Okay, so um, now we have the different scenarios that we offer. So these are again from real life situations, um, and uh, the students can can see this is where where I need to apply this and um, why this is relevant for his for his learning. We provide the toolbox um, where the student can learn different vocabulary, pertinent information, cultural knowledge that will help them in the next activities. And then we launch um, the activities. Again, we have like a video or some kind of resource that the student can listen to or read through um, to glean more information and a more, more cultural relevant um, backdrop. And then he starts to interpret the information that he or she um, gathered. We give some, uh, some prompts and the, uh, the student can start taking notes on this. Um, based on the previous uh, preparation work and research, he can, she can perf um, perform a presentation um, and um, then he or she can talk to other students or to the instructor or a tutor and exchange information that they all gathered during the entire process. 
Um, finally, to sum up the learning cycle, we give a moment of reflection. Um, so the student sees where, where he did so very well or maybe not so well, and we even try to anticipate certain things and give him a few ideas of what um, could be done better next time. And if he so chooses, because the topic is very relevant to him, he again can follow up with um, more activities. So this is again my summary. And um, since the structure is um, very coherent throughout the whole section, it's very easy to use. It's also very flexible. You can pick and choose what you like as an instructor. And for a student, it's a great resource to use German. Thank you. Um, so we've measured some initial impacts on student success, which are really important, of course, and these are preliminary and, of course, uh, the pandemic has been a complicating factor, um, but I think we've seen some really great results already just since uh, adopting this j uh, just a few semesters ago. Um, so one increase, right, you, we often think in terms of the negative, can we decrease the negative, but I didn't want to also forget the positive which is we've seen initially that more students are getting A's and B's um, than in the past, so about 70% uh, initially versus 56%. So not only are students not failing, but they're actually doing better in terms of their grades. Um, our C's have been steady and our withdrawals have been steady, but I, I think considering the pandemic and how that's affected students' um, stability in their lives outside of uh, campus, uh, keeping steady on that is actually a very encouraging sign. Um, uh, Ds have decreased, Fs have gone to almost nothing, as have withdrawals with Fs. Um, and what really matters to me more than anything is the annual savings for students. And this leads also to equitable first day access for students. Uh, I visited uh, just a couple years ago a fourth semester German class um, where students did not have the required textbook, uh, even though they presumably had been in a class that used the same textbook over four semesters, they didn't have it because of the cost. Um, we had done our best to use one textbook over four semesters to uh, mitigate costs, but it was still a $300 textbook that they at some point had to lay down $300 for. Um, and we do not have that problem anymore. And this directly allows students to be successful from day one. They have access even before the class starts. They can continue to have access over the summer um, to review. Uh, it is uh, phenomenal. The initial responses in our student uh, uh, evaluations have been really great. You'll see here on the right, praise for the range of materials, different learning styles, visual, auditory, sensory. Um, you didn't see the full a picture of that because we have uh, links to everything because we're using authentic uh, materials from actual normal German websites made for Germans, not made for uh, language learners. A few of them are, but most of them are, are very authentic. Um, rigor, but also balanced with feasibility. Um, comprehensibility, I'm very proud of. The structure that Susanna took us through uh, is something we carried through in our work um, to make it very consistent uh, in its results. Uh, students praise the scope and the focus, but also the learning gains and motivations, which uh, for me is really important to hear someone say that uh, they want to continue learning and even visit the country because of this positive experience they've had in the classroom. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dylan to talk a bit about the team dynamics uh, and the design process. Thank you, Shane. Um, Again, I'm Dylan Goldblatt, and I just wanted to speak briefly about team dynamics. Um, a couple of things that might be useful to understand about such a large project um, have to do with how we collaborate as a team and how we um, delegate. Um, the first thing that I'd like to mention is when it came to um, breaking the roles down uh, for each individual team member. Um, that did not come naturally at first because we as a foursome all have much overlapping subject matter expertise. Uh, so for that reason, we decided early on that we would essentially break up 
um, some of the curricular effort into equal parts so that we could uh, work on developing the individual modules for the individual courses. Uh, having said that, we installed Susanna as the evaluator or uh, quality assurance person, uh, which I'll speak about in a minute. Now, when it came to collaboration, uh, we held uh, numerous meetings uh, over the funded period so that we could first establish who was going to be uh, responsible for which deliverables. Uh, we set a timeline of deadlines and we also rotated who was going to be the point person for each phase of the project uh, so that we would know uh, who was the uh, kind of accountability uh, person for uh, accomplishing our um, milestones and deliverables in the given time frame. I think as uh, collaborators, uh, we worked well together because we were able to essentially agree and reach consensus on what our overall product was going to look like and then we honed toward that uh, even though we had kind of non-uniform content at the beginning we eventually um, were able to achieve uniformity uh, throughout now in terms of specific role breakdown uh, Shane was uh, in addition to being a an SME and an instructional designer and an instructor of record, he was the grant manager, grant project manager. Uh, Sabine was coordinating the curriculum and had a big picture on how these courses would uh, fit together at all times, was also SME uh, designer and an instructor of record. Uh, and I took on those same roles sans curricular coordination and really focused on the instructional design from a technological standpoint. Uh, putting me in charge of the nuts and bolts or the mechanics, so to speak, of how to make the end product um, accessible and uh, compatible and um, sustainable. And then um, uh, Susanna's role was really a Q&A role. She worked in peer review to make sure on the back end that we had a high uh, quality for all of our deliverables and that they were, um, you know, uniform working links following the pattern. Uh, and when I'm referring here to the template that we were using and the process we were using to achieve that template, I think that um, the viewers who are seeing this video after the fact might want to rewind to uh, minute 17 or consult slide deck starting at slide 7 to really see what that overall structure was that we were trying to achieve with the template. Now when it came to uh, applying technology to this purpose, uh, we had some uh, starts and stops. Uh, we really uh, had a lot of fluidity in the first half of the project where we were trying to achieve a common template. And that posed a challenge because in trying to adhere to the actual standards and um, overall guidelines for how to structure activities, uh, we also had to, at the same time, take into account what any instructor would see when they come into our materials pack. How would someone who just picks this up off the shelf, not someone at our university's department, but someone who's kind of untrained and encountering this for the first time trying to use it, how would they pick it up and use it? And um, that led us to the refinement of the template but also an overall simplification of which technological platform we used. We considered PB works uh, through the library system and a Wikimedia installation uh, through the IT uh, group before ending up with the um, solution that we have now, which is much more like an accessible ebook uh, that e readers can peruse quickly with uh, markdown formatting, uh, which is ultimately the most simplistic um, in terms of its overall delivery and has also achieved uh, our accessibility goals. Uh, now, when I talked a little bit about team composition earlier, one of the things that I didn't mention uh, was how we were leveraging experience and expertise and evaluation differently. So first I want to speak to experience. 
the members of our team really had quite different experiences when it came to materials used for instruction. So this really informed uh, our discussions in a diverse way because some of us had experience with free or uh, very affordable materials. Some of us had not. Some of us had experience with all digital materials um, and some of us had not. And um, then there was the issue of expertise in terms of what everyone's kind of pedagogical training was. And I think that one of the things that was a touchstone for us were the actual standards because they were like the globally accepted um, parameters for how to structure lessons. And you can see each instructor shining through a little bit in the modules that they prepared, but overall uh, the templates achieve kind of uniformity and interoperability, uh, which is a, a real testament to how well we were able to um, reach consensus. And in the final phase of evaluation, um, you know, hammer out any nails that were sticking up too high. Uh, as one final note, um, I wanted to speak a little bit about how this would actually operate. Um, so we have a diverse team with some um, part time and some full time faculty. And we wanted to make sure that our uh, instruction was consistent uh, across those different uh, groups so that we had a uniform uh, educational product uh, that we were uh, delivering at Kennesaw State and also something that would be, you know, something that someone could pick off off the shelf uh, who wanted to use uh, materials that were um, accessible and free. And finally, um, as I think Shane alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, this was meant to be an enhancement to the uh, highly esteemed uh, project out of Princeton, uh, the DRD DAS project, and we wanted this to be kind of compatible and interoperable with that, but also not a requirement. Uh, so it's its its own distinct thing, uh, but anyone who wants to use uh, Daddy Das would definitely have enhanced pedagogy were they to use this. So this kind of broadens its overall appeal, not only to full-time and part-time um, uh, instructors in our state, uh, but all of the uh, programs that might adopt this in the future. And with that, I'll pass it on to my colleagues. Uh, let me add a few words regarding the peer review process. Um, peer review was an integral part of this compilation. As, as we have heard, many people were involved here. Um, and we worked on, uh, the professors worked on different sections independently. So it was important to use clear language and to deliver a consistent end product. In order to do so, I imagined while I'm reading through everybody's tasks and uh, everybody's um, everybody's compilations. I was imagining delivering the portray task in a classroom setting and if necessary I would make um, the wording maybe a little bit clearer to ensure a measurable learning outcome. Um, and I used especially these three resources here and I hope I did this in a constructive way so I constantly refer to the active um, proficiency benchmarks. I always look at the verifiable verbs that we are using those rather than something that doesn't really explain what the real goal of an activity is. And <clears throat> since our learners are the center of everything, I use the self-directed learning cycle. So, um, and equipped with all these three components, my goal was to give constructive feedback when needed and to help guide the project into the right um, direction. On a personal note, um, I felt really very honored to be part of this project and I actually started using this great collection of ideas in my face-to-face -face course this semester. Um, I consulted our compendium frequently and provided students with scaffolded activities when their assignments required speaking or conversational exercises. This changed the content of my course actually quite a bit and made it more exciting for me to teach since it was um, a little bit different than I used to do this before. So, and it was really a pleasure seeing that the tasks and tools and takeaways were well received by the learners. And I was also inspired to create a few more scaffolded activities on my own. So it helped me grow as well. So I just want to say thank you quickly here to everyone to letting me part of our endeavor. Thank you, Sharon. So to run out our discussion, I'm going to briefly talk about challenges. Some of them have been already noted. Um, COVID-19, of course, was a challenge for everyone, but having 
uh, uh, learning materials already online and accessible was actually a huge um, uh, benefit for us um, amidst this to uh, think to myself, what would we have been doing if our students had had physical textbooks or some had physical textbooks, some had had eBooks, and we've been trying to teach in that manner um, during the pandemic. Um, Dylan already alluded to some of the instructional design issues and technology issues, uh, figuring out platform and that sort of thing, uh, as well as our contrasting visions. Um, I would just say that um, as a piece of advice for anyone considering writing an OER, that I would recommend uh, developing a sample lesson or sample unit as part of your application process. We wrote a very thorough, very detailed um, description of what we would do. And uh, I thought we were 100% uh, on the same page. But then when you start actually creating the actual um, pieces and the actual units and modules, you realize that that description, that very detailed and rich description is actually a little bit different in everyone's mind. So that would be my tip is to, to come up with uh, some samples together first as part of that application process. Um, the stability of authentic materials will be an ongoing issue for us. Um, we are directly linking to sites on the web. Um, that's partly for copyright reasons, partly because we want to give students real materials, um, which are more exciting and, and better uh, at preparing them. Uh, to actually use German in real and authentic scenarios. Um, but websites disappear, they become outdated, links get changed, et cetera. Um, so one way we've approached this is you may have noticed that uh, in almost every case, we give students multiple links or instructors multiple links for the same topic. Um, so if one of them were to disappear, there are typically two or three others on the same topic that can be used interchangeably and the structure of the assignment is such that uh, the questions and prompts would work with any one of those videos, for instance. Um, so that's sort of our workaround, but it will require some continual monitoring of uh, these links and updating uh, as they present themselves. Um, learning about copyright and accessibility was uh, big and daunting for me at the orientation session that we went to but it has really changed the way I approach all of my courses, not just the courses using OER. I feel, uh, especially in terms of accessibility, that I am much more aware of needs and techniques to make um, materials accessible for all students. And that's been really a, a boon for my teaching generally uh, in all of my courses. Um, finally, we had uh, a lot to do in a fairly short amount of time. We were concerned as applicants that um, courses in German that don't draw the huge enrollments of uh, calculus or whatever it may be might not be competitive as applications unless we proposed uh, a package of multiple courses. Um, we debated two or four, ended up doing four, both to make ourselves, we thought, more competitive um, in the application process, but also because we wanted our students in all four of those courses to have a consistent uh, products, something that they could be uh, familiar with and stick with. And we knew we needed a bit of a push to get all four courses done um, quickly. So um, that was part of the decision there. Um, I just want to conclude by um, one comment from a student, uh, which to me really speaks to what we were shooting for, which is a combination of challenging and also something that is, is exciting and leads to improvements and to skill development uh, in courses. I think that's the benefit of using authentic materials, but then scaffolding them and, and framing them in a way that are they're accessible for students. Um, and here are two examples um, that I created of authentic materials. One on the left there is from the University of Paderborn, which is one of our main exchange partners where our students can go and spend a semester or a year abroad. So always in the back of my mind was thinking, not only do we want to give students authentic materials to learn from, but we want to give them uh, materials that help them imagine their next steps in the curriculum, which is going abroad at some point. So why not familiarize them with, um, in, the, in the chapter about sports, about the, the sports and, and sport club options at the University of Paderborn. Um, so 
that was uh, a key part of our approach and uh, brought a lot of uh, consistency and coherence and, and motivation to what we did. Thank you. And we now have uh, plenty of time, it seems like, for questions. Awesome. Yeah, you guys are right on time. Um, I'm going to open this up to uh, chat questions from the audience. And then after that, if we have no questions, we'll just uh, move on to a couple I have. I do want to uh, just direct attention to uh, Tamara's comment, Tamara Powell at Kennesaw State, uh, saying that these materials are amazing and the wonderful benefits to students are amazing. And so thank you all for doing this. And thank you to her for helping us um, in an early stage of the process. We had initially applied for a smaller grant. Um, I forget what it was called at the, at the time to augment um, uh, an existing OER, but because DRDDOS is not actually an OER, we couldn't apply for that. And she helped us kind of regroup and figure out um, how to approach the new task of applying for a um, regular size grant, whatever that's called now. I know the terminology has changed a little bit recently, so thank you to her for that support. Yeah, a transformation grant now. Okay. We just took the textbook part off of it, leave it a bit more open. Okay. So one thing when it comes to the creation of new resources and providing them uh, that we've had to look out for in the past couple of years, especially is accessibility. Uh, I know that there was a, a quote from a student talking about it addressing different learning styles, but what about students with different abilities? Have you noticed anything unique to foreign languages when it comes to making sure that things are uh, screen readable and structured and things like that? I, <laughs> I don't feel like I, I have much expertise in this um, yet, but I mean, that is an issue to keep in mind. Uh, and I know we, we talked about this quite a, lit at, a lot at the orientation session, but um, you know, screen readers and their adaptability for different languages uh, you know, do they do they know that it's German? Pronounce it like German? Do they pronounce it like English? Um, is obviously a big issue. Um, we haven't delved too much into that um, because we're using uh, we're linking to outside sources. Uh, most of the tools that students already have at their disposal can be easily used in those, right? So if they have something embedded in their browser, they can still use that in their browser. Um, because they're linked directly to that. Very cool. Um, another thing that I thought was really neat about this project was that you are immediately looking at the benefits of not just free access, but access on day one for all students, so looking at it more from an equity lens. Uh, has, has there been any way for you to uh, disaggregate that data to see if particular groups are benefiting more than others because of this? That's not something that I've looked at systematically. I mean, anecdotally, I know and my colleagues who have taught here longer than I have know even more what that was like, but that was very frequent in our courses as my sense anecdotally that we had students who we're getting by without a textbook for semester A or multiple semesters. Um, but we, I haven't looked at the demographics of that yet. Um, we do plan on doing some more um, systematic data collection once things become a little bit uh, normal. We're doing a, a research study that's we've paused, um, but we do have some demographic info connected to that and we have a, a control. We gathered some info before we adopted the uh, the free resources, learning resources. Um, so that's something we can look at in the future um, is the demographics.
Very cool. And it, I think if I may say, um, I think in my experience, it's been frequent that students who rely on federal financial aid, for example, that the delay is very inconvenient for students who need to have a, a textbook from day one in a class because approval of those funds is oftentimes delayed by two, three, sometimes more weeks. And even if you work with um, supplemental resources as an instructor, you instill in the students a sense of I'm already behind and the semester has just begun. And psychologically, that isn't helpful to the pressures that they experience anyway. So we have been very, very appreciative of this opportunity to run this in this much more affordable way. And this is a, I think this is a practice that we have been trying to not only adopt for the first four semesters, but also for the subsequent semesters in our program and have been faring fairly well. And I think another thing that should be mentioned, I've been around long enough to have seen other departments who have gone to battle about adoption of a new textbook. There have been um, trench wars fought over perceived priorities among the faculty as to the approach or the content and heated debates and delayed decision-making because faculty couldn't come to a consensus. So I feel very fortunate that we were in a small team, but rather very experienced and um, entitled to experienced team, able to work through our opposing, sometimes competing views to come up with a very compelling compromise in the final analysis. But that's kudos to the leadership that Shane demonstrated. So thank you for that, Shane. And thanks, thanks to all of you for the the work that you've done, for the resources that you've produced and shared with the world. I, I think it's it's extremely good. The first uh, content gaps that were noticed in the open educational resources world were really in all foreign languages um, for a long time. It, every single one of the uh, subjects had some sort of introductory content except for language learning uh, across the spectrum. So it's it's really neat for us to uh, be providing this and for you to have created it. So thank you so much. All right, I think we are going to wrap this up. I want to thank all of our presenters uh, for their for their presentation today, for their work over many years uh, to get all of this uh, to the point where it is now here uh, hosted in OpenALG. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, Affordable Learning Georgia, I am always here at jeff.goli at usg.edu. Tiffany is out today, but Tiffany Tijerina is our uh, program manager. Please ask her as well. Uh, you probably saw a spreadsheet from her earlier on in this presentation. <laughs> All the way back from 2013, I saw that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, and I am going to stop the recording now.